monthly lectures widely on animal law and animal law education issues in the U.S. and internationally. So, please welcome. How's everybody doing? Good, good bed chest? Excellent. Well, um, thank you um, for the invitation to speak. I'm delighted to be here. I'm happy to have questions as I go along. I'm very informal. So I'm here to talk about the law and how animals are seen under the law and how that sort of doesn't help them and how we can help them and how we can make some changes. Can people hear me okay? It's probably better if I'm a little closer to the mic. Sorry. Um, okay. So, animals are property under the law. This is true in every jurisdiction in the entire world. So, it's grown up over time, and this is something that a number of folks are trying to work on. And right now, the laws are based on how we want to use animals, not their own needs biologically, right? So, we can have the same exact animal in different legal categories. So if you have a dog, that dog might have a lot of protection under the Anti-Cruelty Act. But if you, if the dog runs away and gets taken into a research lab, that exact same animal is not going to have very many protections at all. Okay? And so we can talk about how that works. But it's because animals are a property. Um, and this is evolving. But what I want to talk about, because we're at VegFest, is animals as agricultural beings and, and as property in that particular context. If you have questions about other contexts, we can talk about that as well, but that's the focus for today. So, when we have animals who are being raised for food, there aren't that many laws that apply. So, in the federal system, these are the laws that typically apply to some of the animals that we use. We have something called the Animal Welfare Act, but the Animal Welfare Act completely exempts all the animals we use for food. It doesn't make very much sense, right? So it's the Animal Welfare Act. And so we care about the welfare of animals, except for the ones we don't, right? And so this act entirely exempts animals being used for food. So there's no protection for them under that federal law. We have something called the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. And that's another federal law that basically says, once we've decided we're going to use animals for food, we, and we're not going to protect them as they're being raised, at least when we're killing them, we should kill them humanely. Except we're exempting all poultry animals from that act. And we, we don't even have to exempt the aquaculture animals. They're not included at all. So we're really talking about terrestrial mammals. Okay? So most of the animals that are consumed in the United States and in the world don't have any protection under this act either, which means you don't have to kill them humanely. Again, really low threshold, and we're not even applying it to the animals in this category. The 28-hour transport rule. Is it a, yeah, please. Yeah. Always exempt. So under the Animal Welfare Act, there are some animals that used not to be theoretically exempt. So in the research context, that applies, uh, the Animal Welfare Act applies so a number of different settings. So animals in research, animals in breeding, animals in transportation, animals being exhibited. And so in the research context, the act says it applies to warm-blooded mammals, except the secretary of the USDA was saying, well, except for mice and rats that we're using in the lab, we're not going to count them. And finally, there was a lawsuit saying um, they're warm-blooded mammals. It's a biological fact <laughs> you can't ignore. And so as that lawsuit was looking like it was going to be successful, they amended the act. And they said, okay, yeah, now we're going to just take them out by the, by the language in the act, which is kind of crazy, right? Yeah, so they took out the – and so that's in the research context for the mice and the rats. But – Anim but the animals have never been protected. Food animals have never been protected under the Animal Welfare Act. Poultry have never been protected under the 20, either the 28-hour law or the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. <laughs> That's a really good question. For those who didn't hear, do they have to have logic behind these decisions? No. No, they don't. Um, one thing, and I can be pretty cynical sometimes about the law, because that's what I'm spending a lot of time on, and I have a lot of critique of it. But to be fair, um, we had a different understanding 
and a different relationship with animals 100 years ago when some of these laws were created. So it wasn't as if people said, let's consider whether we should include poultry, and then decided no. It just never came up, right? They just didn't even think about poultry as beings capable of having some kind of sentience that we should be protecting. So now we have science, right? Now we, it's not just us saying, obviously they're beings, obviously they deserve protection. We have science behind that now, and so that's what we're going to talk about that a little more later, about how we can use that as a framework for changing the law. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's an example, and I'll explain what we're talking about for those who didn't hear. Um, an example of people trying to get the law to do better, and it has a negative consequence as well. So the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, has to certify and inspect um, all slaughterhouses where animals are being processed to become food for human beings. So people decided we should not be... Um, processing horses for food because people in the United States aren't eating horses. It's being shipped to other markets. So people tried to shut that down completely. They were unsuccessful in shutting that down, but what they, decided, what they were able to do was get the federal government to withdraw their the funding for their inspectors. Without the inspectors, they can't slaughter horses for food in the United States. But that didn't dry up the market, right? So the people who were breeding horses in the places that the horses were coming from still needed, wanted, right, to get rid of these horses. And so they just, the market has shifted, right, to Canada and to Mexico. So we only had about four or five slaughterhouses in the U.S. Um, for horses at the time this went into effect. And now we have none, which is great. And they tried to start a few. They tried to start one here in Oregon a year and a half ago, and that failed, which is great. And the, there's still no federal funding for it. The act banning horse slaughter still has failed, so we're still in sort of legal limbo as far as that's concerned. But so the horses are being transported a lot further, and so they're suffering a lot longer on their way to slaughter, which is a really bad outcome. The good outcome is that we're not slaughtering horses in the United States, and so it's one of those situations. There's not sort of an easy answer that's going to fix, address all of the problems that we have. Um, so it's step by step, unfortunately, usually with the law. But you guys are asking great questions. So I'll keep going, but keep up, keep them coming. Um, all right. Yeah? <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah. No. Um, so the, the original act had a different name, and it was... Um, a pet theft act. So it turned out in the 60s that people found out the folks who were doing research on animals in labs were hiring people to go steal pets. So literally out of people's backyards, pets off the street, and they were just, yeah, exactly, just stealing these animals um, because then they were free, right? And they didn't have to breed them and they didn't have to pay for them and they didn't have to spend all the money procuring them appropriately. And then they were going to be the labs, right? And then they were being killed, experimented on and killed. So there was a particular family who found out there, that's what happened to their animals, and they made some really big stink, and they actually got the press to care about it, and there was some real big public, um, publicity around this issue. Sadly, they didn't get their animals back safely before they were euthanized after experimentation. But that's what the original act was about. And then people said, okay, so it's not just dogs that we should care about, we should care about other animals in the laboratories. So then they went from sort of this pet theft act to animal welfare act, and it applied then to other contexts. So not just research labs, but animals being exhibited, so zoos and circuses, those kinds of things, um, the transportation, the breeding, and some of the pet stores. So it got expanded, and so the idea is what is the minimum welfare standard we want to create? Okay, but they didn't think of it really expansively, right? It wasn't all animals, it wasn't all context. And it's really difficult to think about legally coming up with a standard that applies to really different species, like a horse versus a dog versus a fish, right? And so we've been trying over the years as animal lawyers to get them to take it a little bit more seriously, right? To have good enforcement, to expand the categories of creatures who are covered, as well as 
the context in which they find themselves. But it's a struggle, right? So you guys are pretty aware, I'm assuming, of some of the dysfunction in Congress. Yeah. Right, exactly. So this is not their first priority. Um, interestingly, when we bring animal issues to Congress, sometimes we get really good bipartisan support. So this is an area where people can reach across the aisle and say, all right, we, we just shouldn't be doing some of the things we're doing. So that works a lot better when there's not an industry behind what we're trying to change. Right? When there's an industry behind it, yeah. And then we had trouble, again, across the aisle, right, Democrat and Republican. So, so they weren't being sort of snarky about this. This was actually an early decent standard, and in fact, a lot of countries followed the U.S. model. The good news is a lot of countries that are developing these laws now are developing it on a more modern understanding, um, which is good. So they're kind of going better than the U.S. in some respects. So the U.S. has some really strong laws in some areas and not in others. So we're not the best for farmed animals. Europe is much better than we are. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Okay? Good. Great questions. So these other two acts, the Poultry Products Inspection Act and the Federal Meat Inspection Act, are only inspections inspection processes after the animals are dead, right, after they become food. So they have nothing to do, again, with animal welfare. And these really are it. This is all we have on the federal level. People tend to say, oh, well, there's too much federal government, right, too much regulation. This is it. This is what we have for farmed animals at the federal level in the United States. And so poultry aren't included in anything. They are included in the Poultry Products Inspection Act, of course, after they're dead, right? It's not to do with their humane treatment up until that time. So there are no federal laws that apply to animals being raised for food while they're being raised for food. The only laws that apply are when we're killing them or we're transporting them. Sorry. <laughs> we'll keep this going. Um, but all right. Good. Now it's frozen completely. <laughs> Yeah, please. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a pretty significant hurdle, and that is that the federal government has authority. And once the federal government does something, it preempts the field. That's a term of art. It says basically no one else can do it unless they want to give away that jurisdiction to someone else. So even the states. So there are some things the states could regulate because the federal government doesn't. But in the areas where the federal government regulates, nobody else can. And so we end up trying to get them to enforce these laws better. Um, but one of the problems that we have is that the, um, the agencies, right, I think this is working out. Okay. okay. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is the agency in charge, and they have a dual mission, and part of their mission is to support agriculture. And the interesting thing is when I was a kid, agriculture meant plants, right? And now it means animals, and they really mean animals now. I mean, they privilege their support for that part of the ag sector over plant-based um, everything. Right? So the organic plant folks are upset, the small farmers are upset. General, I mean, we've got a lot of products in the room right across that are all plant-based, and they're not getting the subsidies right? that the livestock industry is getting. They're not getting the subsidies that um, the fishing industry is getting, all that kind of thing. So that's one of the, the biggest hurdles that we have. Yeah. All right, let's see if this is. Yay. Okay. So at the state level, we have some laws that folks may be somewhat more familiar with that affect animals. So we have the state anti-cruelty laws. Most of the states explicitly exempt those laws from applying again to agricultural animals. Okay. Also, usually from animals um, hunted animals, animals in research. So they really were designed. I'm coming back to a question. They were designed to protect pets, right? Companion animals, and so those. Categories have been expanded over time, so some states have really expansive language in their state anti-cruelty laws. It just say we're going to protect animals and you can't treat them. And again, this is not being cruel and not being neglectful. It's not necessarily setting a high standard of care. Right? Some states say you have to provide water and food and 
appropriate housing based on the climate, right? Some don't even say that. Some just say you can't abuse them and you can't unnecessarily, right? You can't cause unnecessary harm or suffering. Um, but a few do now um, cover ag animals, and so there have been some prosecutions in those states based on factory farms and some of the things that have happened there. Um, we have had at the state level ballot initiatives. So people just like yourself say, we don't think this is sufficient. We need a lot more protection, and we need protection for these animals who aren't getting it, right, in the state or federal system. So we've had all of these kinds of ballot initiatives be successful over the last, say, 15 years, right? So initiatives to stop gestation bans, field crates, battery cages, tail docking, decline, these kinds of things, right? People say, not in our territory. We don't want you to behave this way. And so we've had some successful ones. There's only about 24 states in the country that allow this uh, initiative, but this initiative process where people can bring things to the ballot, right? Otherwise, you have to go to the legislature. And Oregon is one of those states that we have used it for animals. Okay. Yep. And so, so there are different ways to look at that, right? So sometimes an animal gets stuck in a category. And so if the animal is labeled a food animal, then certain laws are going to apply. Um, but what we tend to argue is that it's because most of the law really looks at how the human being wants to use the animal. So you can have a pet cow in Oregon, and then that animal falls under the anti-cruelty protections and is not a food animal, right? Yep. And so that, that's what we would argue. So that's the difficulty, right? It's not sort of written down somewhere that you get to say it. So this is a legal argument, and, and I can ch chat with the sanctuary folks to let them know at least how I would pitch it, right? Um, but saying that we understand the animal may have come from a food context um, and is in a sanctuary, but is not ever going to be a food animal, so that restriction shouldn't apply. So there's two reasons that so there are some restrictions in, on that particular context, so what animal, what can go into animals from a sort of veterinary perspective might become food. Obviously, there are certain things we don't want people to ingest, right? So certain kind of drugs or chemicals. There's enough already in food animals, right? Um, but the other thing is sort of this protective, protectionist kind of um, intent for veterinarians, right? And so they don't necessarily want uh, farmers or ranchers to do all the vet stuff themselves because they, they don't make the money. And so there's some of those issues that come into play in the regulation. I'm not sure that that's what's going on right here. Yeah. Right. And so I would just have them argue it's no longer a food animal. So, yeah. Yep. And so state to state. Yeah. Where you're from. But generally speaking, I mean, there. So you can have a pet chicken, right? In Oregon. And that can be a companion animal. Or you can have a chicken you're going to eat. In your backyard in Oregon, it can be a food animal, it can be kind of a hybrid, right? So it gets a little confusing, um, and so this, right? So people, but people, because animals are property, the minute that you own an animal, you're the one who decides. Okay, so depending on whatever restrictions there are in your state, that's what's going to govern the limitations of your behavior. <laughs> Um, so that would be sort of in a regulatory, so it's not under a law, it's in the regs, regulations that sort of support the laws. And what, it, what you will find is there are certain things that can't be administered to animals. We're going to go into food production. And so there's a food, there's a human food line at slaughterhouses, there's a pet food line, right? Animals that are not sort of good enough to go into the human food line, they're still going to be eaten. Um, and then there's other, right? So if it's other, then it doesn't matter what the animal has suggested. But if they're going to go into food, there are certain chemicals that shouldn't be in them. Yeah. So that's a couple other hands. Yeah. Yeah, 
so really quickly, it's going to differ state to state, so it's going to be a percentage of the population. And so the idea is if we're going to allow citizens, right, to act sort of like legislators in this way, we want to make sure they're somewhat representative of the population, and we're not going to waste time putting this on the ballot if only a few people are interested. So there's a different numeric threshold in every state. And so I actually don't remember, I thought it was like 125,000 here in Oregon, but I could be wrong, so don't quote me on that one. Um, and so you would need to get that many individual, different, distinct, and valid signatures of citizens of that state. And all they're saying is we want it on the ballot. Now, we're going to vote for it even, but we think it's appropriate for the citizens to actually vote on it. And so that just happened with the wildlife bill here, right? There's 100, and so now it's going to be after it is on the ballot. Yeah, so you want to be really careful about the language, right? Because the, the language may be what's on the ballot. And so there, there is a committee um, down in Salem, right, that you would want to pass this stuff through. And I don't know if it's always the same people. I don't want to say I don't know that. And so you just get that vetted, then you have the petition printed up, and then they have to validate. There's a committee that validates all the signatures to make sure they're not you know, Mickey Mouse that goes on. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. Someone who actually knows it. So that changes then every time. That's a little frightening. <laughs> Yeah, there's always, if you're going to do something at the, so I've talked about the federal level and the state level, if you're going to do something at the constitutional level, there's a much higher threshold to do what you're doing. Yeah. question because when we think about the impacts that agricultural animals have on the environment and on the ecosystem and on um, the economy and lots of things, we don't always take all of the aspects um, into account. But the, the model that we have for producing food through animals has a lot of problems, and this is one of them, right? So we have government-owned land, state or federal, that can be leased to private entities for ranching. Right? So that means they can have their cows on that property. And then those animals end up having priority. They're not supposed to have priority over endangered animals, but those are arguments we end up having. Um, and so we need to think about that. Then that's another whole sort of conversation. But um, there's, a, there's a division of the government called wildlife services. And so those folks, if animals are harassing right, these, these animals, and it doesn't even have to be on federal land, um, they can be called in to kill past animals, predator animals. So it happens at the Portland airport, right? So animals that are going to interfere with flight paths can be killed through that program just as well as coyotes affecting cattle and cows. So I'm going to see that we're sort of already at halfway our time with a whole pile of slides. So I'm going to blaze through some of these um, and but holler if you have important questions too. So a couple of other things at the state level just to be thinking about. I won't talk about all of these things. So labeling, um, there are some labeling laws. This is a way in which people are trying to regulate sort of the backwards how animals are being treated. One, because people don't want to put bad labels, right, on their food. And the fact that some people can put good labels is a disincentive for people treating animals sort of badly and however we might frame what that is. Um, and so we could, again, do a whole talk about what labels mean and which ones are legally enforceable, which not many are. Um, but just be thinking about that. Um, Frog is just sort of an example um, in New York and in California of, again, state regulation to try and end some industrial practices that people thought were really inappropriate. Um, I mentioned other countries, so the EU, the European Union, does a much better job than we do in the farming area. Um, some countries have now said not only are animals property, but we haven't changed that status, but we recognize in our legislation that they are sentient beings. And that's really going to change. It's going to take a little while right, to work through the regulations. 
that's changing things. Um, we haven't done that yet in the U.S. Okay, I'm gonna, so there are three sort of parts of this presentation. So that's the overview of animals as property. Now we're going to talk about how people are silenced, people who work for animals through the law, and then I'm going to talk about aquaculture in a minute. So does everyone know what ag gag is? Pretty much, so there might be a few people who don't. So really quickly, there are pieces of legislation that say, and through a different, couple of different mechanisms, that you can't share the information you get Basically, these are undercover folks, right, from facilities where animals are being raised or processed, right? So you no longer have sort of a First Amendment sort of protection to do that. So there have been a lot of undercover investigations, and it's really hurt the industry. So we've had all of these kinds of outcomes, right, where the consumers are upset, where the industry is being shamed, and they're being sort of forced by consumer demand to, to cut back on some of their most egregious practices. In the beginning, they used to say, oh, these are all lies, it's not happening. And then they say, oh, it's a bad apple, it's just, you know, one employee. And after years and years of these kinds of videos, people are like, okay, this is a problem. Like, consumers understand this is a problem. And that's really bad for the industry. So obviously, in that context, we have a lot of significant issues. It's not just animal welfare, but food safety, consumer choice, workers' rights, free speech, environment, these are all problems affecting these are the states. Um, the blue states are the ones that have ag gag laws. The orange states are the ones where people have tried to pass them and they have failed. So I'll talk about the start states in a minute. Um, so the elements, so they, and these are criminal statutes, okay? So it's already a crime to trespass on private property. It's already a cr crime to commit fraud, but that wasn't enough. So they decided they needed special laws to prevent these undercover folks. So recording without consent is now a crime. Accessing a facility or getting employment under false pretenses is a crime. This means lying on your resume, in a sense. It's become a crime. Um, and they have quick reporting. Ones that say, if you see anything bad happening, you have to report within 24 hours so that you don't end up building a record. And you, so we talk about that. Exactly. Right. So we have about seven states that have these, and they have different, different ones have different aspects. Yeah. So a couple of them apply to agriculture, and some are broad. So the broadest one, the most recent one, is North Carolina. And folks are saying this is basically an anti-whistleblowing. Um, statute, and it could apply to nursing homes. And so the coalition of folks in North Carolina who are opposed to that bill is really broad as a result. Yeah, so some are really focused on the ag context and some are not. When you focus on the ag context, it's really clear who you're trying to shut down. So the Idaho law is just such an example. Um, so one of the things that's interesting is that these criminal penalties are sometimes, well, usually much higher than the crimes that folks are trying to report. So the crimes of animal abuse that are happening, and I'm not just talking about industry, industrial practices, I'm talking about people, you know, whacking animals with implements, really bad stuff. The penalties for whacking the animal is much lower than reporting, which tells you where our priorities are, right? Um, so, yeah, talking, so we have these lawsuits. So the Idaho is in orange because their law has been declared unconstitutional. It has to start because they've appealed that. So, but they looked at this, the conversation in the legislature and said, yeah, you were trying to shut these people down. It's really clear you were trying to shut down the free speech of these particular folks who can't do that. So, yeah. That's right. They have not tried to pass one in Oregon. Yeah. Yeah, we got a solid animal law crew here, so we'll see. <laughs> Think they know better? It is. Yeah. Texas is interesting. It, it doesn't always go the way you think it will, right, with these, these acts. Um, but, yeah, I'll just leave it before I say something I shouldn't do. <laughs> um, so Amy Myers is just, um, one of the folks who got arrested for a gag. They did drop the charges. She was taking pictures of what was happening from public property outside of a facility, and they arrested her nonetheless. The person who wrote that bill also had a stake in that company, interestingly. And we could talk a lot more about that. Um, some other things to keep an eye on, uh, right to farm bills, which basically say you can't sue these um, folks under nuisance. And if you do and you lose, which is likely, 
you have to pay the attorney's fees on the other side. Um, there are other civil rights concerns, including that some of our large farms, especially on the East Coast, are being managed by prisoners who are either on the property or prisoners are being leased out to do both plant agricultural and animal agricultural operations. And of course, we're not really getting paid for that work. So you have people in prison taking care of animals in prison. That's kind of sad. Yeah. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of this and we can talk about. Or, yeah, you know, Taylor? Yeah. Um, so there is some good news I want to say. So people are getting upset at these ag ag pals. So there's been a lot more resistance. Even in legislatures, there have been some, even Republican governors are willing to sign them because they're so clearly, some of them, unconstitutional. Um, we do have uh, her whistleblowing suit was, um, the charges were dropped, which is really good. We also have this brand new report that basically says consumers are losing confidence in this sort of whole food system. Because the point is, if you don't want us even to talk about it, if you don't want us to know what's going on, what's going on? And exactly. And so that's a really logical sort of outcome that they didn't really think about. And so the more they push these bills, the more people are resisting. So, but they've gone from slightly trusting the industry, the consumers as a whole, to slightly distrusting. And this was a real broad brush for consumers across the country. Um, there was a defamation suit against PETA for calling a, plate, a facility a fur farm. They said that was defamation. It's kind of interesting, but um, that didn't go anywhere, which is really nice. So, their freedom and lives, um, as well as our freedoms, are at stake in this area. We can talk more about that as we go through. Um, just check my time. Okay, so let's talk about aquatic animals real quick, and then, and again, if you have questions, color, but we'll try to leave some time at the end. Um, so, when I, oh, there were a couple of hands? No? Okay. So, when we talk about aquatic animals, we don't even know what we're talking about, generally speaking. When I tell people I'm working on aquatic animal issues, they're like, oh, fish. Yes, fish and all these other creatures, right? But they're not in our consciousness. We don't see them, and we really, if we don't see them, we can't see them, right? And we can't bring them into sort of the realm of protection because we're not thinking about them. So part of our, um, so we started an aquatic animal uh, initiative at the clinic at Lewis and Clark. And part of our, for our goal is to have people recognize that they exist and to recognize that they're wonderful and they need protection as well. Um, and that they exist sort of all over. So they oceans, streams, lakes, right? So we're not talking about just the oceans. And they're used in all the same categories terrestrial animals are used in, right? So they're pets, they're used for food, they're wildlife, entertainment, work animals. And we use them just like we use all other animals. And again, if we don't see them in these categories, which we literally don't physically see them very often, we can't think about whether they're suffering or what protections they need. So our job is to make them visible. And to talk about the science. There's great new science. There are reports, studies, that show prove all of these capacities for aquatic species. Not for every single aquatic species. For, you know, we don't have a hit for each one of these. We don't have a study for each one of these for each species. Because there's 4,000 species of fish alone. <laughs> right? But we basically know now that aquatic species, how many people sort of were raised with this idea that goldfish were dumb? Right? And that fish don't feel pain the way we feel. Right? And they don't have memories. And they don't, right? They just aren't in the same sort of sphere that we have to consider. All oh, that's, that's not true. So goldfish can live up to be 30, 40 years old. They have memories that can be three years long. Fish have families. They can, they can do all kinds of wonderful things. So a couple of things. This is a moray eel and a trout, and they cooperate to hunt for food. So the eel is smaller, thinner, and can go into crevices that the trout can't go in and flush out prey food so that both the eel and the trout eat better when they work together. So this means they need to understand each of them Cells, right, as a cell. I'm a trout, you're an eel. I know what you can do for me. I know what you can do for me. Let's get together, communicate, do it, right? I mean, that's a lot of cognitive processing. Um, and that's just one example. These are cleaner fish, um, helping out a turtle. And so these are fish that eat the parasites off of other animals. So they like the parasites, obviously. The animal with the parasites doesn't want them. So this is another area of cooperation that works really well. And one of the studies I love shows that 
when there are other animals visible, the other animals who might be the, the next clients to the cleaner fish, when they're watching, these fish will not bite their clients. They actually tend to prefer like the skin as well as the parasites, so they would love to eat their clients just a little bit, but they won't do it if someone's watching. They know, again, right, these are potential clients, and there's a reputational value for not biting. It's stunning, right? And if there's no one watching, they might nibble every once in a while. Not so much to piss off the client so he won't come back, but they might get away with it a little bit. But they won't do it if someone's watching. Again, the mental and cognitive processing to make those kinds of choices is pretty much what we do, right? Um, there's a study that came out just this summer that manta rays have self-awareness. Oops. So this, you can't really see, this is an, a mirror on the far left side of the screen of each of these panels. And the manta ray is swimming by and doing things that manta rays don't often do. So exhibiting unusual body movements and checking out his or her underneath, right? Which you, a manta ray would not usually get to do. And apparently they can sort of walk by, swim by, blow bubbles in the mirrors, and they're watching all of this, you know, sort of occur. So this is one of the, the mirror test is a cognitive test for self-awareness, right? To understand that you are you, and that's different than you, right? Or you. So I am me, and I can act in the world, and I can see the consequences of my action, and then I can make choices based on that. And so this is a new test that has come out to show that manta rays are part of the category of folks who have this self-awareness. So my suggestion is that we actually have enough science now that we should really shift our thinking. We should presume animals have these capacities and not the other way around. They don't have them until we're proven that they do have them. They're all beings. They're all alive. Right? Evolutionarily, it makes sense that they're smaller. <laughs> so let's assume that. Let's apply the precautionary principle, which basically says let's not create regulations that cause harm unless we can really prove that we need to and that we're minimizing the harm in that category. So I think that we have enough data to do this. I know it's a really radical call, especially in the law and certainly in science. So we're not going to get there anytime soon, but this is what um, we're going to be working towards. I'm just getting to that. Yeah. There isn't. And so the law is a really interesting um, discipline in that it sort of sits on top of other disciplines, right? So lawyers, as lawyers, I don't know what sentience is. I have to talk to scientists, right? So if I have an economics problem in the law or a medical problem, right, in the case, I need to go to those experts. So so there's no legal definition. Um, and so I would also say, as much as sentience I think is critical and important, I don't think it's also necessary for protection. Right? So if we don't think an animal is sentient yet, I still think that animal needs protection. Right? So, but people are working on that. The, the interesting thing is the definition of sentience and which animals are included in that definition is changing as we speak. And so it depends on which scientists you talk to, you're going to get a different answer. But the law always follows much more slowly. Right? And so we'll see what the law ends up incorporating into definitions. So yeah, aquaculture really quickly. So... We are using more animals than anyone realizes for, for food, um, both for food for humans and food for other animals. And these numbers are only going to grow. The U.S. government has funding to increase the industry, both here and abroad. And there are people abroad who don't have stable sources of food, right? Hunger and poverty are problems in lots of areas. And this is being seen as a solution. And so, and trying to solve some problems that are real and need to be solved, we're going to create some additional problems. But just look at these numbers, right? So 74 million tons. All the international standards, we're not even talking about individual animals anymore. We're talking about tonnage, right? So we talk about not seeing them. And so just fin fish, right, farming, we're talking about $97 billion in 2013. And these are the most recent, 2014 and 13, are the most recent numbers I have. And it's just getting more and more every year. So the estimate is by 2030, 62% of all food fish will come from fish farming, so aquaculture. Basically, factory farms for fish. Okay, so everything that you know about factory farming for terrestrial animals 
is now happening for fish and has all the same consequences environmental, disease, everything. We'll talk about it real quick. So, what does it look like? This is, you know, I'm just going to show you some slides really quick about what it looks like. These are all fish farms. They're from different parts of the world. So, you'll see some are outside, some are inside, some are man made with lakes and lagoons, some are industrial facilities. These are crabs. This is Australia. The scale of production is just like we have for terrestrial factory farms. It's enormous. And the consequences to the environment are just as bad. So we have dead zones, we have animals escaping that have been modified or diseased and are killing wild populations. So that's fish farming. We still have fishing, traditional fishing, right? This is called capture. Um, and it's happening in pretty significant numbers. The picture on your left is um, rows and rows tables of shark fins drying in the sun. These are just fins. So for every fin, there's a dead shark, right? Generally thrown right back into the ocean. And those are just tables of shark fins at one facility. And there's blue sharks on the second on the side. So the numbers, when we're talking about Combined the fishing, the traditional fishing and aquaculture, we're talking about over 2 trillion fish a year, right? Killed. The numbers are mind boggling. And we have no regulation, generally speaking, to deal with this, the kinds of concerns that we have. None about welfare at all, right? And I'll talk about those kinds of things real quick in a minute. Um, but let me just go back. So in the U.S., we do about 5 million. Uh, fish capture. That capture is the sort of traditional fishing, if you will, and only a half a million in aquaculture. But the U.S. is going to go really quickly. So in the next five to ten years, these numbers are going to change pretty dramatically. These are the slaughter methods. So again, they're not part of the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. So these are the kinds of things we can do to kill fish. We can talk about that more if you like. There isn't. So there's not a combined figure. So we have both the waste in the oceans or in the streams or in the facilities. Oh, yes, the waste. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And so we, the food industry estimates that about a third of the food produced um, a year gets wasted in the United States. And that could be at the restaurant when you don't finish. It could be it goes bad before at the supermarket. And it gets sort of all, all through the food chain. But it doesn't take into account the nets that get lost at sea, right? It doesn't take into account all the other animals in that ecosystem who are dying as a result of pollution caused by. So there are a lot of animals. It doesn't count the bycatch, right? So we're trying to fish for these animals. We get these animals and, and kill them and throw them overboard. And that's not just for fish, right? That's all food, uh, including produce. <laughs> so it's a delicacy in some parts of the world, so they make it into a soup, generally speaking. Yeah, yeah a soup in particular. Yeah, so there's it's a sort of gelatinous, um, and they sort of boil it down and it goes into no, not typically, um, although it is a delicacy in some Asian cultures, and so you could find it um, a while back, I think. I'd be interested, actually, to know the answer of how many places in the U.S. would still serve it. Um, so, sh I would... Yeah. Right, because it's... it's it, right. It's, so it's it's something to, to aspire to, right? To have enough money to afford this delicacy to serve it to your guests. It's the status symbol. It's all this sort of thing. No. Not really. It's just, yeah. But it, there's also very significant effort on the part of some animal protection organizations to reach out to those communities from those communities. And say, hey, we don't, there's other ways for us to go here. We don't have to do this one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Highly prized. Yeah. Which is, nobody's going to kill animals in any quantity unless they can make money on it. Doesn't matter what context. 
Yeah, there has to be money. Um, so we have significant, our oceans are in desperate straits. Right? We have species who are going to go extinct. The corals are a mess, right? They're dying all over the planet, and they can't sustain life the way they need to. This is uh, just a couple quick examples of bluefin tuna. Since, just since 1960, right, we've lost 96% of the population in the Pacific Ocean and 85% in the Atlantic Ocean. Whales, we have the seven resident killer whale population right here in the Pacific Northwest. There's only just a few months ago, I could have said 85 of them. There's 84 of them now. And the government's thinking about reducing their endangered protection status, um, despite the fact that they're, they're one of the, the species listed as threatened one of the top eight and going extinct in the next, next decade or so, right, if we're not careful. And there are so many different things, not just fishing, right, but there's noise, there's shipping, there's pollution, right, there's loss of their habitat and their food supplies. Then we have, yeah, so, um, typically it's, it's pushback, right, from industry, right? So there are people who want to use animals as resources. And so to the degree that there's restrictions on their ability to do that, they get upset. Um, also, when there's an endangered species um, designation, that protects not just the species but the habitat. And so that restricts other things you can do in that zone that may not actually – people may say, well, we're not going to kill those animals, of course. But we want to have more fishing or more chips in that area. And we just don't think the danger is significant enough. So this is a great place, right? So there's a lot of tables over there with people doing exactly that. So it's a really, really good question. We're not as organized, we're not as well financed as the industry, and we're not ever going to be. <laughs> right. And I think people are trying to make efforts, and there's, uh, I think some of the organizations are doing a better job these days of trying to collaborate with one another on things like that. Measure 100 here in Oregon was a great example of that. So that's it. The challenge is people care. There's so many animal issues to work on, right, and trying to get everyone together on the same page and agree with a strategy. A political strategy is challenging. So it's not just that people aren't doing it. It's, it's complicated, yeah. But people are trying more and more to figure out where do we have alliances and how can we sort of um, use those synergies. Yeah. I'll speak on OPD and tell me what we do. <laughs> I mean, part of it really is, is, is being asked, right, trying to get the word out. So our work in this area, as I'll discuss, is, is relatively new. But we started looking and saying what area of animal is being addressed, what group of animals is not, or people not really talking about, and this is how we got to the aquaculture issue. So let me zoom up. What it's doing. Well, so you guys can all start spreading the word, right, and ask for more information, ask for more programming about this, right, ask people when you go out, well, where did this come from, or, you know, start asking questions, and then people might start looking for answers. So we can all do this. Yeah. So the TPP is focused on the Pacific, um, so it's the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, um, and so that's really focused. But there are trade agreements that deal with Atlantic fisheries as well. Um, so there's different regulatory systems. Yeah, so, um, so the TPP isn't all about fisheries, but it includes fisheries, so it includes all kinds of trade. So um, it includes Oregon apples just as well as Oregon beef as well as fish. So um, 
Oregon, though, has said the Oregon aquaculture industry has said it's pretty small. Um, so there's some oyster fishing happening out in Lake Tillamook um, on the coast, but they want to increase by five-fold in the next five to eight years. Right? So there's a push to increase the aquaculture production in the state of Oregon. Um, so we've been trying to get the other side going, okay, if you're going to do that, <laughs> there are some other things to be thinking about for a and what's their issue. So I don't know how big a voice we're going to be just yet, how much people will listen to us, but we're trying to be there in the conversation. Sure. So real quickly, um, some other issues that we need to be thinking about. So genetic modification of fish. So the fish on the bottom is a farm salmon. This is not even a wild salmon. Okay, so we're not talking about completely natural. This is a farm salmon, and this is a genetically modified salmon. Both are 18 months old. Right? So this shows you what we can achieve, if that's what we want to call it, through genetic modification. But it shows you why people are doing this. Right? So if you can produce that kind of an animal, you're producing a lot more food, right? You're producing a lot more money, right, per animal. Um, and that's why people want to do this. So um, we can be thinking about that. Diseases. So when we're farming these animals, we're creating all kinds of zoonotic diseases. Some are transmissible to other animals in the, in the wild. Some are transmissible to humans. Humans are transmitting diseases to these animals. But given the conditions, just like terrestrial factory farming, right? They're cramped, they're overcrowded, they're living in their own waste, all those kinds of things. They're being given food that isn't their natural food. They get a lot of really significant diseases. And this comes back to your question about waste, right? We're not counting these animals in the tally either, right? The ones who die, right? Well, the good news is they're not. Um, but, but you can see that lesion, right? You don't know if the lesion hasn't popped yet, right? And you're eating animals who are still ill. Right. Right. Um, so the pet industry, as I started doing some research, I actually had no idea how many animals were involved in the pet industry for fish. So we're talking about six to ten million, um, well, two hundred fifty million goldfish a year in the U.S. It stunned me. I had no idea. Right. Two hundred fifty million just goldfish in the U.S a year for the pet industry. Um, so tropical fish are really um, heavily prized all around the world, but in the U.S. in particular. Cyanide is used to catch them very often in the Philippines alone, 500 metric tons of cyanide a year, killing 50% of all the other animals right around the fish they're trying to capture, right? And these animals are coming across U.S. borders. People are estimating 6 to 10 million fish caught that way with cyanide, right, which is not something we would approve of in the United States coming in through our borders. Um, so just right in the coral reefs, lots of people in the U.S. have fish, have a keep fish. So this is what some of the pet trade breeding looks like when it's done in the U.S. Fish kills, so this is bringing fish and ag together again. So fish kills are usually a result of too much of pesticide runoff, right? There's not enough oxygen in the water that's usually coming from pesticide, not always pesticide or fertilizer. This is the Indian River in Florida um, in March of this year. They estimated 50 miles of the river were affected. It didn't look like this for 50 miles, but hundreds of thousands of fish dead like this, right? As just one, and that's one fish kill, right, in the United States in one year. Um, significant problem. Endocrine disruptors, so we're putting a lot of other stuff in our waterways too, you know, just pesticides and fertilizers. There's medicinal waste, there's all kinds of stuff flushing through our bodies or just as um, waste in general. And so the studies are showing that we're affecting animals in the wild. So the U.S. Geological Survey studied, and this is in 19 national wildlife refuges, so it should be some of the cleaner places right, in the U.S., and they found still 60 to 100 percent of all males, well, small mouth fat, um, fat eggs, which means right, they're having female reproduction that they shouldn't be having. So this is having a huge, huge impact on the species. Um, and so this intersex problem has been occurring throughout the U.S. and North America and elsewhere. And obviously it affects other species, not just fish, but um, other animals as well. It comes from birth control pills. It comes from all kinds of places. Yeah, and but there are some estrogen in even plastics, right? So 
there's some that's maybe These endocrine disruptors are getting into the water, and basically it's affecting their genetics. Yes. Well, no males would have eggs, right? So they should just be males, right, producing what males produce, and the females would produce eggs, so it would be zero percent. So another thing that we do a lot of in the U.S. oil and gas exploration, we do seismic testing. Um, they're supposed to be permitted and they're supposed to be regulation. It turns out that has not been really well enforced. Um, and there's significant damage done to animals. Previously. And this is just the exploration, right? This is not even the production, right? This is just testing to see if these are going to be good facilities, good locations for, for the oil and gas development. And so just in the Gulf of Mexico, the environmental impact study suggested that 31.9 million marine mammals, and again, not all fish, right, just marine mammals are going to be harmed through just this one project. So that tells you the scale, right, of what's happening. So one project in one region and one category of animals. So if we went out to other categories of animals and other tests in that region, we just multiply, right? No, this is just seismic testing to see if there's enough oil for them to begin production. We haven't even begun to talk about the environmental damage with production, right? So this is before they even begin. All right. I think we are at time. I know there isn't a, a panel afterwards, but you guys may want to get to another panel. Um, so I am happy to keep going, but if anyone needs to leave to go to another panel, that's okay with me. I totally understand. So, is that, I should keep going? Yeah, all right. <laughs> I'll keep going and I'll go quick, quick, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and I will try to um, actually post this um, presentation on our website at the law school. So, just Lewis and Clark Law School Animal Law, that'll get you there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so really quickly, um, focusing on the law. So we've already talked about the anti-cruelty laws. So there are 10 states in the U.S. Which, in which fish are not excluded from anti-cruelty protection. Okay. Um, there are 20 states where they either don't say they're um, included or excluded, so it's not entirely clear. But in most of those statutes, they're exempt under the agricultural research exemptions, right? So, um, so and this is what laws protect animal, aquatic animals in general, right? So some states might have some protections under the anti-cruelty law. They're completely not covered under the slaughter laws, completely not covered under the transportation laws. There's a teeny bit of breeding, depending on what sort of regulatory system you look at, but really not very much coverage at all. So they're exempt from the animal welfare. Act, unless we're talking about marine mammals, um, because that only covers, remember, warm-blooded, um, mammals, um, invertebrate animals, right? So that means that the animals in the aquariums and in the pet stores are not covered by the Animal Welfare Act. And maybe, especially if they're marine mammals, there are different laws that may protect that. Um, so when we're talking about animals that should be covered under the Act, research, we're talking about hundreds of millions of fish um, for exhibition. Again, this was a number I didn't know. 20 million caught for exhibition annually. 20 million animals, um, stunning, stunning numbers. So there are some <laughs> pieces of good news. So wildlife and endangered animals obviously receive more legal protection, um, no matter what kind of animal we're talking about. Companion pet animals get some, some protection, marine mammals get some protection, and there are some protections in the research context, even for aquatic animals under the Public Health Service policy. <laughs> Yeah, so we have a significant problem out here, right, the Bonneville Dam. And so it's sea lions and salmon. And so what we've done is create a dam, right, which makes it hard for the salmon to survive. Um, and then the sea lions are super smart, so they know that they're going to be bunched up salmon, and so they come and eat some of the salmon. And so you would think, okay, well, that may be rough for the salmon, but it's okay for the sea lions, except 
the sport fishers, right, want to have enough salmon at the other end so that they can kill the salmon. So they don't want the sea lions eating all the salmon. So we have, and some of the sea lions were under the Endangered Species Protection Act and the salmon were. So we actually had this legal battle between two types of endangered species. Um, but the slide I showed way at the beginning, there was a sea lion with numbers in her back, and that's been branded. That's an animal that was no, just the opposite. That means that animal has been deemed a, a pest, has eaten too many salmon, and if that animal continues, that animal will die, will be killed. Yeah, so that again could be a whole conversation because we have tribal treaty rights that need to be honored and protected, right, for fishing. We have sports, so there's sort of economy around fishing. And then we have the Endangered Animals, and we have the Endangered Species Act, and the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and then the need for, you know, the the hydroelectric. So there's a lot of conversation around that particular um, issue. It's really, really complicated, but the sea lions are losing over and over. People have been trying to sue to protect it, but they've been losing. Yeah. Um, there is some good news. <laughs> there's been a lot of bad news, so let me leave you with some good news. So we do have a proposed ban on swim with dolphins programs. Yay! Because those are really awful and unnecessary. Um, we're creating the first green uh, Obama did. Yes, that would be nationwide. So there aren't that many in the U.S. I mean, Hawaii is in Florida, but it would be a nationwide ban if it goes into effect. So it sort of helps people um, understand, habituate to treating animals that, again, as like toys and play things. There's a lot of disease transmission. Those animals are usually kept in really filthy habitat. They're not allowed to engage in natural behaviors. Or, you know, they're taken from the wild and kept in these pens so people can Jump in the water. Yeah, Wataji well, is right. Again, another conversation, right? But there's some good news um, with respect to Japanese whaling. So the, the, um, the committee has basically said that the Japanese exemption for research should not be honored. It's, it's fake. And so, but now there's a ruling on that. Um, and so they've asked the Japanese government not to issue any more permits under the research exemption. I don't think that. Listen, but at least it, it's another regulatory step that people can rely on. That activists can say, this, now this proves this is going to be covered. Um, we have the first National Marine Monument in the Atlantic, which is really cool. We have one in the Pacific. There's a sonar case, um, which I can talk about later. People are interested in against the Navy. Um, that after the fourth attempt, we got some success. Saying so the Navy can't just kind of willy nilly do the stuff they're doing with sonar when they know it has a harmful impact on the animals. Sea World is ending, right? Breeding and shows, yay. Um, the cosmetic test ban has been upheld. We don't really talk about research. Um, there are proposed organic standards, which would put potentially some welfare conditions for um, farm fish, shrimp, and other species in the farm context. We're going to have the first dolphin sanctuary, and there's a, a whale sanctuary um, in the plan. Um, and the National Academy of Sciences said that. 77% of the world's fisheries could be restored to health, almost full health, in the next 10 years if we just change our fishing practices. So that's an enormous environmental benefit that we have no ability, right, in any other sphere of environmental damage to sort of fix, right, if we just change what we're doing with fishing. So hopefully people will get that message and we'll, we'll move on. So some people are so it's going to home um, dolphins from the Portland Aquarium, which is a national, I mean, not Portland, sorry, Baltimore, the Aquarium in Baltimore, which is a national aquarium. So they're going to release them to the sanctuary. They'll be the first ones there. Yep. So that's all still sort of being built in, potentially on the northeast of the United States, but that's not um, clear entirely yet. Yeah. The United States Yeah, that'll be the first one. And uh, I just chatted with the person who's working on the whale sanctuary, so she's looking at the Pacific Northwest and the Northeast. So still looking for what would be appropriate sites, looking at the law, looking at the geography, right, for the whale sanctuary as well. So it's a great question. I think it sort of depends on what you're interested in doing, right? So there's enough work for everyone to do. And for, for 
you do it in your own way. So if the fish thing is calling to you or, you know, the eye gag or whatever, all the other panels and all the tables, just do something, right? So I think the main message from VegFest is consumer choice really matters. So what you eat, what you wear, and, and the, where you put your money matters. And the industry really, really is paying attention to that. Ten years ago when I was doing these kinds of talks, we could say that, but it wasn't happening, right? So people were like, well, it doesn't seem like it's making a dent. It's making a huge dent. And consumer choice is moving industry way faster than law is, way faster than science is. So, so continue. Yay. Right? Keep doing what you're doing as far as that goes. Join organizations that you like the work they're doing and see how you can help. There's, there's all kinds of ways for you to do say that some of this tends to be more costly, and I feel like as a person who has some means, it's my responsibility to pay that cost to make it cheaper for everyone else, right? So if we can be the vanguard and make it more mainstream, then it can be in everyone's neighborhoods and not just in old things. Yeah. 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 So you're welcome to come to our classes. Um, they do get kind of law heavy sometimes, and so that's a little challenging. We have some law students in the room who may um, be great contacts as well. But they also bring in speakers, and those speaker events are open to the public. And those folks are speaking to a more sort of diverse audience, and it's not all law all the time. We have an animal law symposium in the spring, which um, some of that's law heavy, but some of it really isn't. Um, a lot of these kinds of things that we talked about. We, we sponsor the Animal Law Conference every year. This year it was in New York. It's done, but it'll be, we already know, October 13th through the 15th back in Portland. This coming year, and that has a lot, it's much more accessible. Um, so those are just some things that Lewis and Clark is sponsoring. So feel free to go on our website or the Solve the Student website, uh, Lewis and Clark, for those kinds of events. Or all of the things we do are open to the public. Come and sample, and if you have questions, talk to the students, talk to me about any of that. I will say there's um, animal studies programs um, that are happening more important too that are focused on other things besides the law, and so there are, there are other things going on in Portland to help with this kind of education as well. Yeah. So, Lewis and Clark does do trainings actually specific to that. So, um, the National Lawyers Guild as well um, here in Portland is a great chapter. And so, if you are interested in being a citizen activist and understanding your legal rights and what you need to do to protect um, yourself or protect other activists, those are really good sources. So, the student chapter of the National Lawyers Guild does trainings here in Portland, and the National Lawyers Guild chapter does the Portland chapter do really good trainings as well. Uh, so the National Lawyers Guild is national. Um, so the chapters in every state. Yeah, yeah. They do. They do. Yeah. And the universities may also have chapters as well. So just go onto the you know, the National Lawyers Guild site, and that will lead you to where you need to go. Yep. So you can see, right, just with this conversation, we need more and more animal law trained attorneys out in the world. And I, this is just a sliver, right, of the kind of conversations we have on a day-to-day -day basis. So trying to convince people to hire them, right, to fund them, that's, that's the challenge. But animal law is one of the fastest growing segments of the legal field. It's just a small segment, so it's growing. <laughs> Well, 
Well, one of the problems with law firms is conflicts of interest. So they already represent, yeah, exactly. So that's especially the big firms. But what we're finding is that a lot of the big firms do pro bono work. And so they might do a companion animal case or they might do something where they wouldn't have a conflict. And they're taking on some really, really important cases. They helped with the ag ag lawsuit in Idaho um, and donated millions of dollars of hours um, to that. So law firms are, are getting more and more. Before 9 11, they were, this was one of the biggest areas of growth for law firms was to do pro bono animal law because it's cutting edge law, right? And so it's exciting. People, it's really empathetic, right? People are like, we're saving lives. We're, it's, it was a great way to have young attorneys cut their teeth and to have the firms make a name for themselves. And then 9 11 happened, and the pro bono stuff kind of went down, and the 9 um, 11 and then the economy tanked, and so pro bono really disappeared. So it's coming back. Um, and yeah, there are a number of firms still really heavily engaged in this, but the complex ends up being limited. In fact, there are a couple of firms that are just animal law, environmental law firms, but they're small. And it's mostly nonprofits, right? Also, we want to get our students into agencies, right? Government agencies and with judges and even with industry, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And was there another question? Yeah. What would the government do? Um, they panic. <laughs> Um, the government is actually invested, right, in, in these different industrial sectors. And so to the degree that they are making some presumptions and using taxpayer money, right, they would, they would be trying to figure it out for sure. They couldn't do anything. I mean, they couldn't stop people, right? So if everyone said, yeah, today we're not going to sort of the idea behind the Meanest Monday program, right? If people just said, let's show them what kind of consumer impact we can have to weave it to week. And said, just for a week, people don't eat any fish. That would show how much fish gets eaten in a week, first of all, how much money we're talking about. And it might encourage people, you know, to diversify into more sustainable. So, the, the, again, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has as its mission to support agriculture, right? And so they spend money to, so that whole um, stuffed crust cheese pizza, that came from the USDA, right? That was their idea. They needed to come up with a way to get more dairy used. So they came up with that idea for a private company, right? So that's unfortunately how it works right now. So I think exactly what was said, they would come up with ways to say, hey, this is a great source of protein, or get your omega 3s, or right, that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, that would be a different group. That might not be the government, but yeah. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> So there were just a couple slides about, um, and let's see if we will do it again. Thank you. Um, just about the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative at the law school. So this is our mission statement. So our goal is to synthesize, right, the interests of animals, the interests of people, and of the planet. So that we're trying to find solutions where we're not in conflict, because that's, uh, I think, tends, tends to happen. So that's part of the important part of our mission statement. So just outlining the need, I think, for this work, which I think we've discussed a little bit, um, and why it's good. So those are, those are my best two slides. I think that's so thanks. As a social services person, one of the things that you, it's not a direct answer to your question, but the link between animal abuse and human abuse is really well documented. And so I don't know what populations you work with, but, um, and so, You 
can call me anytime if you want to bring some students by. If you want, they can. We can mention them with our law students. So if you want to attend the whole semester, you know, it, you're not going to understand a lot of it because it's a law class, but if there's a particular class or some session, we can create a session for your students, or we can, if there's a session you think that might be helpful, they want to just come in and attend. Mm -hmm. So there's an animal law program, yep, and you can see if there's something there that, that it's useful. But I think given that population that you work with, helping them think about their choices and think about the consequences of their choices, we find it's actually a really good way to help people to begin to think, right? Are there ways that they can go to a shelter and help care for animals if they have the right sort of training, they're ready to do that well, right? So there are different ways to sort of affirmatively work with folks. So, <laughs> well, like, I can't, I've got my card, you can give me a call and see if you can, yeah, sure. I know there's, yeah. To be clear, right, we, the nice thing about the U.S. is we have representations of all kinds of cultures, right? And so there are, we don't typically eat horse in the U.S., but people eat horse, right? In the U.S., people eat dog and cat in the U.S. because it's part of their culture. And so, but it's not, I don't see it coming in in full force at all. And in fact, I see the opposite in other countries. So I see that um, as there's sort of an urbanization of some of the other countries, people who move to the cities are ending up having relationships with animals they didn't used to like pets, right? That wasn't sort of so common in a lot of countries. It's becoming common with a new generation of urban dwellers. And so if you have a dog as a pet, that makes it harder for you to think of a dog, right, as, as food. Um, and so there's a lot of conversation within those cultures, um, which is the right way for this to happen, right? It's not for me from the U.S. to say, hey, you guys are wrong, right? Because they'll turn around and appropriately say, hey, you guys eat cows, you know, right? And that's a perfectly appropriate response. So it's much better for people within the culture to say, you know what, this is not actually that older tradition, and this is not happening all over this country. Where does it happen? Why does it happen? Does it have to happen? And can we start to narrow this kind of thing down? Yeah. And, and but people are doing amazing work all over the world. Yeah. 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 Ye